So when you have a, a, you know, a predictive analytics available to accurately predict when a customer comes, how much of quantity I have to keep so that the item is always there to a 99.86% predictability. One is you need insight about who your customers are. You need insight about what their needs are. And then based on that, you need to sharply carry the inventory that is relevant to them and take anything that's superfluous to them, right? But this also means that this kind of Six Sigma you know, predictability that you're talking about, unless you control your value chain, unless you have visibility of inventory across your value chain, you will not be able to achieve fill rates, which are, you know, you will need 95% fill rates for the kind of thing that you're talking about. Average fill rates in the industry are 60, 65%. So how do you manage the fill rates for your business? Because if you're carrying minimal inventory, unless replenishment is done on time, you will have lost sales. Most retailers have upwards of 30, 40% lost sales because they don't have the right, you know, in the grocery, it may be simpler, but in the fashion item, it's a lot more complex. Yeah? So there are some aspects that need to be worked on. Maybe because in your business, you've taken control of your warehouses, you've taken control of your... Uh, A, keep that experience intact, but make it relevant. Uh, so uh, just, I'll take two minutes uh, extra here, is just to make all of us sitting in this table uh, come from a time frame where we have grown up with Raymond. Uh, with all due respect to other brands, but you know, Raymond was something that was there as our first college uh, blazer or whatever. Now the brand as it was perceived then was more, uh, you know, uh, more from uh, our point of view and our kids don't normally relate to it. Maybe about two, three years back, uh, I've heard youngsters saying, uh, that's my dad's brand. Uh, and this I'm talking about Raymond. I'm not talking about Park Avenue, Color Plus, and all of that. It's Raymond. Uh, so for us, uh, it was very important to change that perspective. So therefore, uh, uh, you know, uh, when we launched the new stores of Raymond, we understood two things. And we have done intensive research to, to arrive at this uh, conclusion that, one, uh, experience within the store, digital versus physical experience. What is the balance that we need to bring? And as he was rightly pointing out, that there should not be too much of digital in your physical store. Because what happens is, uh, then you lose relevance. Uh, you know, there's too much, of, too much of noise around you which takes you away from the decision-making process to buy. So what did we do? If you go to any of my new Raymond uh, stores, you will find that there is no POS counter. We have done away with the POS. Uh, we run it completely on an iPad. So you just go, uh, you scan, and as you keep scanning, the product is behind in my stock room, which gets moved into a trial room automatically from behind. So your merchandise is ready by your size, your color where that you've selected in the trial room. Now I'll tell you how that happens. So the question comes, uh, is everybody happy doing it with an, uh, you know, using an iPad? No. I have typical uh, people who come from Dodaballapur to my 100 feet road store, son's marriage, first time that gentleman is wearing a suit in his life, and he just gets scared. And we just don't show him the iPad. We know, we understand the consumer, we go to him, and we start talking to him and taking him through the journey. Now coming more to the digital part, if you go and see some of our la larger flagship stores have got the robotic scanning. Now what is a robotic scanning? If you go to a made to measure stores, there are people who come and say, I want to come back the second time and the third time for the measurement. They like that feeling. They like standing there, somebody precision, you know, the master is, master G is measuring you up, they like that feeling. And then there are those 28 years old, 29 years old, 30 years old who work for the IT companies who says, hey, you know what, just scan me. So there you have the robotic scanner which scans you and that's why we, we also say that we no longer tailor suits, we engineer them. So if you, if you actually go to a factory in, uh, in Dodbalapur, uh, you know, it's completely robotic uh, which happens there. So that is the balance that we have brought 
between digital and physical experience. Now, what uh, Sheshu just said, you know, uh, depth of merchandise. Now, most of us, when we go to a store, we see that you have, by size, you have a particular shirt being stacked, right? So you'll have a size 40, a 42, a 44, and so on. We just changed the whole thing around. We said, we want to display more styles and let the sizes be behind. Uh, uh, 16 options of white shirt in different styles. So we not only conserve space, but we give the consumer much more in terms of his decision making. Can I have a yeah. you know, quick thought? Um, there is this, uh, you know, take the decision on that choice. So you have 99 types of white or 99 styles of white. So it, does that work for you? Absolutely, Offering? it works. I'll tell you why it works. Because initially, uh, see, you have to understand, uh, Raymond uh, builds on their customers. You have to understand. Uh, I can't say much about online for Raymond, uh, but we are selling through all the Jabongs and the Mintras and the, uh, you know, the Flipkarts. But if you traditionally see what Raymond has been, and so we said, yeah, so white shirt. And then we said, oh, this is white shirt. It was not white shirt, it was white shirt. So then we took them through the journey. We said, look, this is how it is. This is how, you know, this is a casual white shirt. This is a formal white shirt. This is a white shirt which you can wear with a bow. This is a white shirt which you can wear just with a ja jacket. Or this is a white shirt which you can just wear with a jacket. So then what happened? The consumer was very clear. So it is exactly like how you want to buy a television or a mobile phone. You know exactly, I want a white shirt, what is the occasion? occasion-based, what is the style that I want? And we are always there, physically standing there to take you through the journey. That can never be replaced, is what I'm trying to make a point here. You know, we, uh, I'm, 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 I'm sorry to say this, but every time we take a reference of the Western world, I would always like to tell people, please understand this is India, and in India, people have a different way of understanding and different way of shopping. You know, when I go to Canada, or if I'm in US, the amount of interaction that I see of the floor staff to the consumer is minimal. They will not trespass onto your private space until and unless asked for. It's just the opposite here in India. They want people, I mean, I have run supermarkets and hypermarkets where I have got, you know, people, ladies who come and say, I want a personal trolley pusher. So now, one quick question about uh, you know 99 kinds of white. How do you translate that online? Physically, it's great. Uh, yeah. So 99 shades of white is uh, 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 very difficult to uh, you know kind of do that online. It's actually a good way to get customers into your store. You want 99 styles? Come to the store. Yes. Uh, so uh, online, I, I don't know, know whether you've seen the white campaign that we. I've seen the campaign. Yeah. But I haven't seen the shirts. So oh, you, you need to come, come to the store. store. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, if you actually go to uh, the RaymondNext.com site, you will find all the 99 options there. Uh, but I would again urge that, you know, if you are able to make it to our uh, uh, Chennai store or our Bangalore store, the flagships which are there, you'll find uh, most of the options available there. And it's been doing very well for us because uh, something that was... Yeah, yeah. So I was uh, my parents' 50th anniversary day before right. They were in some trouble also because of demonetization. So I said, no, I'll go to Titan now. I have never been to Titan, by the way. So I went to Titan, South Extension. So I went traditional, regular retailer. You go to the counter, open shows. So I said, nahi, maza nahi aya. Let's, let's go somewhere else. So I said, let's go back to Hazurilal. So I went to GK. And I was entering GK1 market, if everybody has seen GK1 market. So I saw a store called Zoya. Mm -hmm. I stopped. I said, looks nice. I went in. And I must tell you, within half an hour, I bought something. It was like an art gallery. Very nice lighting. One, one piece of different collections. I went up to the store, first floor. I just saw through the windows, I said, show me this, show me this. She bought it on the table, 
I like two things. I said, how can I decide so fast? Yeah. Means I liked it. I said, let's buy it. And the way the guys were explaining, there was a girl and a boy catering to us. Just two people, and they were only speaking, and because I, I really, so in my family, I am the guy who shops, because I love shopping, <laughs> I like retailing. So, so they actually helped me buy it. I had decided, my wife was with me. I said, how can I just shop so far? Let's show me more. I said, you tell us. So I went again, and I said, actually, I like what you showed me. And I promise you, in half an hour, I had bought a very expensive thing, checked out, went back home. Next morning, I get a call. I get flowers. I get a card. I get a gift which says, congratulations <coughs> to mummy, 50th anniversary, your mother and father. And I swear, when I left that store, I said, thank you. <laughs> I actually felt like saying thank you to the two people who sold me this, which is very strange because the way they treated, the way they served, they served cappuccino, they had chocolates, they had nice warm cakes. The cakes were brought from the house of chocolate, a very premium luxury cake store, chocolate store in Vasant Vihar. It was a real experience. And the lighting and the sitting and everything was so, uh, maybe uh, it was premium, but it was accessible. Yeah, I completely agree. So, you know, we have something which is called the concierge Sorry, service. Uh, if I can Sorry. just interrupt yeah. you for a minute. Yeah. I just want to, it's a great example. I want to, oh, well yeah, I want to decode the, the various elements, you know, just to understand. So it's amazing to hear that you'd never heard of the brand, you'd never seen the brand before. And you walked, maybe you were a little bit, Zoya, Zoya was familiar. So, but you had never walked into the store. So, so one is, there was something about the shop front that attracted you, right? So experiential retail, one, it starts with a brand awareness. Let's not forget, I have had at the Mall of Emirates, I was, the CEO of Mall of Emirates was a very dear friend called Phil MacArthur, city center, he ran Asia's, best-selling mall at that time, 10 years back. City Center Dubai was, Dera was one of the, the highest footfall, highest per square foot revenue. Aldo brand was made there, the highest revenue. They used to tell me that they do monthly audits of show window. The mall does, which we spoke at Select when we, uh, we worked together a lot and we spoke, we must do audits at, as a mall developer for show windows. It is very serious. The show window attracted me, it was like, well, the Awad collection. And Awad <coughs> means obviously modern Awad, royalty collection, 50th anniversary, it all fitted in well. Yeah. So if you can just, you know, I want to just decode this whole thing. So one is the, the store, store front, the show window, you know, that created an impact on you. Then when you walked in, were you greeted by somebody at the... Yes. That's interesting. So they created a differentiated experience. It was not like another jewelry store. Right. Okay, the best part is, yeah. Sri Ram, you all know, we always say ground floor, very expensive. We have to use it the maximum. There was no bloody selling at the ground floor. Ground floor was only a gallery. It was just windows and small windows and displays and, and you had to go. There was, there was a woman to lead you. Sir, you want to please go up. There was the store. That's where you sit. It was very nice. So they change your mindset, right? So they said, I'm not going to be like a Titan. I'm not going to be better than Titan. Uh, not Titan, Tanishk. I'm not going to be better than anyone. I'm going to be different on you. This is something that we were talking about. So this is a classic example of how you can actually, if you have the courage to do it, create a differentiated. This was a very important example here while we were talking experiential retail. The lighting was as if I was in a New York art gallery. New York art gallery. Everything was very spotlights. Like yeah. Abercrombie does. If you go to Abercrombie store, whole it's, a store like a it's a nightclub. It's a nightclub. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, fascinating to hear that story. Very useful to. Now you're in the exhibition space, right? Mm -hmm. So can you share uh, your thoughts on how you create uh, relevant experiences for your customers? Sure. See, uh, I think the first thing is for the robotics. 
that's not really digital for us and for retail stores. The digital is uh, the heavy engines which work at the back end. And the kind of experiences those engines offer to the front end, which is the experience. I'm not sure how many of you have seen a uh, Disney wristband video. So uh, Disney, all across its uh, uh, you know sort of parks, ha has implemented a wristband. When you choose an experience, you just pay through that wristband, the hotel room, uh, the rides you want to take, the food you want to order, the shopping you want to do for your family. Now pick this example up and superimpose on the retail real estate experience. Nobody has really seen the digital out there, but there is a digital of sensory digital which is working at the back end in, in real estate space. Right? And the experience that they are feeling is in those particular retail stores that you would classify as the different rights. So, uh, so how this has this digital world? I mean, as Sanjeev rightly mentioned, too much digital, right? It's for it's for particular retail store to decide how much digital is too much digital for you. The f uh, the other critical aspect that we have realized is uh, the the touch point of consumers is the person who is manning the store, right? So the speed and agility of that person of taking a decision and basing his decision on something will convert that customer into a real buyer for you. So uh, footfalls, do, this is not a, uh, a valuation play, right? Where you sign up customers and then you get into a valuation play. For you, the real business is the conversion of that footfall. So, so that is extremely important. So that how you really uh, coach and decentralize the thought from the boardroom to the person who is the first touch point for the customer in terms of taking it further ahead with customers. All right. Um, can you continue the you know discussion on the experiential part? What is it that you feel needs to be delivered and how? I, I'll just touch a different. They prefer taking a risk, like uh, Sanjeev said, that, that the millennial guy doesn't bother about that the master has to do it. Well, the millennial guy is ready to take the risk because he trusts more the technology part rather than a human being. And the classical guy tr trusts trust the more human being rather than the technology part. So there has to be balance. And when you're looking at the retail landscape, it is now saying brick and mortar and online. Now the two make together the retail landscape. If your customer journeys are not going to be complete from one point to the other, I may see it online, want to buy it in the brick and mortar, and vice versa. Now, if the journeys are not complete, the experience element goes off. Let me give an example of uh, Book My Show. So when I was trying to look for tickets for my son, I saw there was an offer. And then we realized we were just close to about 45 minutes. Book My Show doesn't release tickets for you if it's 45 minutes. So we went to the theater, and I had an ICICI bank card, and I gave that card, and I expected the offer to be given to me. And the guy says, no, that's only for online shopping. Now, that takes away the experience. So unless you have seamless journeys, customer journeys, unless you have thought through to one of the points that he mentioned, SOPs have to be in place. If you, if you sit in the boardroom and say, that's how we are going to deliver the experience, and not be able to translate that to the front end and monitor, measuring is important. And if you don't measure how your front end team actually delivers that, and if you're expecting at a 12 and a half thousand guy, a geek to be available, a technology savvy guy, it's not gonna happen. It's a journey as a retailer you'll have to take. You'll have to think through all the touch points. And when there are stores within a mall, then you have to think of right from the parking till the time walks out of the parking. You can't say, I'm just going to take care of his experience when he walks into my store. If the entire mall is going to run through end of season sale and you have done a digital marketing, you've given promotional vouchers, the entire experience is out of the window if the guy is going to struggle with parking. I think that collaborative approach in the retail landscape is absolute necessity. Others just taking the word digital and then saying we are actually there will not really make sense. That's one aspect. And the other thing which I think the retailers have to think of, and I'm not being anti-retail here, I'm just saying that right on the Diwali day, do you really need 75% off? <laughs> right. The whole festival is about buying new stuff, new family stuff. If you've not got your value proposition right, you cannot do digital because that costs you money. And the only way to fund it is respect your margins, make sure that margin is funded back to deliver an experience. Because just in another six months, you would have spent on technology and not be able to sustain it, 
There's a cost of sustaining, maintaining, running it. If you're not able to do that, then one fine day you'll say, okay, forget digital, let's just stick to brick and mortar. But then you've lost the customer because suddenly he feels you made me taste digital and now you're saying it's not available. So that's another thing which I feel retailers will have to take into account, the collaborative and good old days, we spoke of value chain. Now it's value network. Customers touching you from every aspect and for that matter, the customer wants to talk to your design team and saying, what does this style mean? Uh, if you're unable to connect that on a digital platform where the thought process that went into the design of the style is communicated to the front end and the front end is able to express it with the same method of how a designer would talk to you, unless we do that journey part, I don't think we are really delivering digital. Thanks. You brought in some really important points. One is, uh, I'm reminded of what happened at Apple, uh, their new head of uh, retail. Uh, earlier, she was designated as a head of Apple stores. Then she said, uh, I don't think that's the right way to look at the business. She said, I need to actually have control over the entire retail business of Apple, whether it happens offline, online. So they actually redesignated her as uh, head retail, not head Apple stores, right? So they, just like when they dropped the word computer from Apple, now it's just Apple Inc. So I think we need to stop you know, differentiating channels as retail formats. These are just channels, whether you you know, buy through your mobile, buy through the website, buy from a physical store, buy from a kiosk, whatever. These are channels for customers to access us. So we're all in the retail business. Retail encompasses everything. Now, so one is we need to have a holistic view of retail. We need to be relevant across all touch points for our customers. And the other important thing is we need to focus on value proposition rather than price. I think that's critical. All of us think that price is the value proposition. I remember 15 years ago when Colorpolis was the brand that used to be most sorted brand and I was working for Pyramid Retail that time and we were, my company was trying to negotiate with the brand on the terms and all that stuff and somehow I got to know that the brand is very clear, this brand will never be discounted. You may go on EOSS, TOSS, we don't care and that was holding the brand and frankly speaking I did not see the sales going down. Since as part of IT I got access to sales data, I could review and I that was one brand which never went down on sales. Right. Now, there's a philosophy that you hold that my brand means value. I deliver quality. I give you some value for wearing Color Plus. Whether the little tag on your pocket said Color Plus, yes, it give you some privilege. Now, unless we get to that level of thinking, all this digital will go out of the window because we'll not have money to fund it. First of all, the margins are tight. Right, you're operating in a competitive market. We are blaming e-commerce to have taken away brick and mortar business. The business is not gone, it's only increased. What you've lost is the ability to express your value proposition. I think that's important. And making sure the journeys are seamless. If your journeys are not seamless, the customer is not going to come back to you. Because one break point, and he's on Facebook saying, this guy actually, we went there and bad experience. It's also both the ways. It's a double-edged sword. It means you go digital, he goes digital with you. Right. The turfs change. Right? Yeah, yeah. So the resonance is much higher much than higher. what in a physical store would have happened. And so, he expects you, I'm sorry, sorry. I'll just add yeah. one more point. He expects you to give relevant message. In the sense, uh, you, you, you invited me saying, okay, we have a privileged uh, sales for you, and please come to my store. Now you know he's a size 42 blue color guy. He loves blue color shirts. But you don't have it because size 42 is cut size otherwise. Anyways, in end of season sale, you're talking of 39 and 40. Why invite that guy all the way to your store saying, come, there's a sale? So the relevance is also important. And ability to connect your inventory data to create a promotional message is important. And connecting the dots at the back end, at the front end, is absolute necessity. Yes. You have anything specific or in general? You know, device to watch a movie. It lasted for five years, seven years, maybe ten years. What happened after that? The <coughs> the movie tickets used to be about 30, 40, 50 rupees. Today it's gone to 300, 400, 500 rupees. We still have the channel available. You can still watch movies at home. Earlier, you could only get a CD or a cassette and watch a movie. So you can buy online. You have hundreds of channels to watch a movie, but you still go to a theater. The business is gone up maybe 100 times from 80s or 90s, not in terms of value, even in terms of pricing. So this experience thing is going to stay. It's not going to change at all. Today, fortunately, we are in a country where there are not too much of things to do outside within the city. If you are in Bombay or in Bangalore or in Delhi, what do you do on the weekend, around a weekday? 
Do you visit somebody's house? Maybe not. Would you go to India Gate or go to Juhu Beach or Kolaba? Maybe not. What do you do? You have to go out somewhere, you have to go out with your family, with your friends. You end up going to which place? To a mall. Why do you go to have an experience there? It's not just about shopping. You go to eat, to uh, watch a movie or entertainment. And why do you go there? Because there are many factors, you know. You feel secure, you feel safe, and you do shopping. It's all about the experience. Now, this is going to stay here. Let's, let's not forget. It's going to stay here. They're going to get some, they have some benefit because they're giving you discounts. How long is it going to stay? The discount, I think, is slowly being pulled out. So, but you have to create a balance here. Can shopping center create a balance here? Can they offer also offer a certain discount to somebody who wants to buy online, maybe give them some kind of uh, discount there, come to the shop and pick it up from there, rather than giving home delivery? So create a balance there. Because as I said, you know, people today before coming to the shopping center to a shop, they do a lot of research. They check the prices, they check what is there in the market, what is not there, what is in the shop. They come to the shop and they say, now let me buy. Still there's a tendency to come and buy in the shop. That's why the offline is going to stay. It's not that it's going to disappear. It's only like how do you scale this up, how to reach out to more people, and how to give them that experience is very, very important. Thank you. I think that analogy of how you know, movie watching from the television at home to DVDs to the multiplex, that's a good point that you made. The movie industry has managed to first build on the experience and second, profit from that experience. They've been able to actually charge a premium, right? And they've invested in, you know, per screen, they've invest, invested in sound technology, they've invested in creating a wow experience. Uh, so I think that's one lesson for us at retail. The second is to ask, how do we create ROI from that? You know, there is a high capex involved in investing in that. What they've realized is there's only so much they can charge from the ticket. Average ticket realization is about 130, 135 rupees for a multiplex, right? But they're able to charge for the popcorn. They're able to charge for- They create a different line. They create a different business line altogether. That's right. So we need to ask, what is it that we can do uh, if the customer is only going to pay X for the product that we are currently focusing on? Is there a set of services that we can add? Is there a set of experiences that we can deliver for which we can charge a premium? Or at least a price, right? Those are questions to ask. So, you know, you are in the, again, the jewelry business. You are talking to a premium customer. What is it that you do to create that experiential uh, retail? And what are the challenges that you see? So I think there are two or three interesting things in our space. One is, uh, India is largely a gold-dominated market. The opportunity to own the consumer in the entire life cycle. So whether she's a girl or a man, you know, all the way to, from marriage to retirement. And therefore, how do you build a value proposition for a consumer or a brand with heritage, but a contemporary rendition of it? So unlike most jewelry brands which you see, uh, which, which will have bright lights, yellow colors and everything, ours is a black premium store. The other is issues of the concept of more, can I, can I see more, can I see more? And I think you spoke uh, very eloquently of this concept of segment of one. Okay, segment of one is what I'm talking about, is a issue of mass customization. That can every piece of mine be in the color, the design which I want, and what does it mean from a supply chain perspective? So the girl who wants something is very different from the mother from the, this. So, so I think there are two parts to this entire thing. From an experience perspective, we built up Belgian heritage, black stores, uh, minimalistic focus on designs uh, from just and just to give an example of what do I mean is if I want to build my heritage and a consumer walks into the store you would normally spend half an hour at the store but never ask the consumer who you are what does the brand stand for if trust is critical we have a heritage wall which says one in 18 diamonds in the world belongs to us now after you've said that you don't need to build anything else now then the consumer will come back and ask you who you are and what you are the other interesting thing is when we're talking about digital, non-digital, I think the interesting part is the discovery of a store normally used to happen, and I think uh, Amitabh spoke very eloquently that he saw the uh, uh, you know, display, he walked in. Discovery is now also moving online. So what we are discovering is one in two consumers is actually discovering you online and not necessarily offline. And once a consumer discovers you online, is the experience same? Part two is from a merchandising perspective, and again, I go back to the segment of one, is a consumer who's seen your product online. Chances are, okay, the difference between a consumer who's seen, first will walk into the store and say, will you give me this Aura Platinum Couples Band, which I've seen, 
versus a consumer who's just a walk-in and says, what do you have in platinum rings? And inherently, that's uh, the difference what, what, what we are seeing at, at, at Aura. In fact, uh, that's a good point that you made. In fact, I have a piece of uh, research data. Uh, a white paper by IDC Retail Insights revealed that consumers who shop both online and in the stores spend up to three and a half times more than shoppers who only use one channel. So, the, so uh, clearly there is a, you know, a point that we need to take. We need to encourage people to use multiple channels to access us. Uh, and retail has to encompass all touch points rather than just the physical one. And uh, I think we've not heard enough about that point that you made about uh, you know, segment of one. There is an immense opportunity for us to personalize and customize. Mass customization is something that we can use really effectively. We can learn a lot from uh, you know, the channel of um, using data, insight, et cetera. And if we're able to do that, recognize customers when they walk in, be able to personalize what matters to them. And maybe because of that, we're able to charge a premium. If not premium in the you know, sense of uh, premium on the price that we're charging, but premium on getting them repeatedly into our stores over a period of time. Yeah? Now we have somebody from Philips here. Uh, Sorry, may I make a couple of yes. points? Yes. Yeah. I'm just continuing something from what Mr. For instance, the Raymond store, uh, last evening when I saw it, the first thing I noticed is the light that you see from very far away, the way it is lit up, the glass facade, and it's definitely a draw. What Amitabh described, it's not technology. It is it's visual impact. And that is something that is lost in a lot of Indian stores right now. Maybe because the focus on technology is because the target is millennials, and they live and breathe technology. Maybe the Gen X guys have been slightly forgotten, like us. Which just brings me to my next question also. In the future, will retailers really become more like technicians running on big data and analytics? What happens to the gut feel, Kishoreji's gut feel? Will that die out? Will we run only on numbers? This is my question to everybody. Uh, so how can so we create experience in retail using lighting? Yeah, is um, lighting technology or not? <laughs> yeah, it is actually. <laughs> Um, uh, good you mentioned that. I think uh, from both of you, I think I take a very big cue into uh, my points that I wanted to make. Um, I, I felt like the odd one out, which is why I thought I'll speak last, because I'm from the... Uh, but then I realized that I'm not very different from everybody here, because uh, I've been also a customer to all of all the brands that you all represent. Uh, it, it's actually, uh, you know, every, uh, every product company or every technology sees a big transition once in a lifetime. So I think lighting has been going through that, you know, the digitalization. And Philips as a brand has seen a lot of such changes in the uh, B2B space as well as B2C space. So you have uh, in healthcare, be it consumer durables, and now lighting, right? So what, I mean, we talked about some, I picked up some keywords from all your uh, points that you've made, some very, very excellent points. When we say digital, is it just like moving from an analog phone to a digital cell phone? I mean, Nokia thought that was the thing, right? I mean, but then smartphones came along and proved them wrong. So a 3315 could be a digital phone. You can call it a digital phone, but it's not actually a digital phone. I mean, we've not seen what's the extent of which that stuff can do. I mean, Steve Jobs felt that, you know, uh, that thing with Scully, which happened in 85, which threw him out of Apple. You know, I saw that movie in which uh, this guy tells him, that, you know, why did we, at the end, you know, he says, why did we differ? I mean, where were we not working together as a chairman and this thing? You from Pepsi and I'm from, uh, uh, you know, from the technology side. You know, see, he said, uh, you know, I like the Newton which you brought out, but, you know, it didn't use any of this. It didn't use a fingers. You had a, you had a stylus, right, to browse through. So this is why, you know, we could have done some great things. You are a great marketing guy. I'm a great technology guy we could have but we had differences and I had to leave Apple so you know this is a very interesting insight you know all of us as shoppers have five senses right it's basically if depending on what I want to buy which is the sense that needs to be stimulated the most I mean it all come boils down to that so how do I say for example someone wanted to buy a jewelry store walked into Zoya he was more stimulated by the visual sense, right? His visual senses took priority over everything else. 
I want to buy a garment, I go and touch and feel, right? And colors, so it's a combination of my visual and my uh, touch sense, right? So in very pure basics, all of us are talking about going back to the basics. Earlier we were having a chat about, you know, experiential is there, but what's the basic hygiene? Do I have a washroom in my store? Do I have a chair to sit in my store? Right? Or do we look at overseeing that for greater freedom on FSI? You know, all of that is there. But experiential, as you mentioned rightly, is too in bare, very basic layman terms is, you know, how do I trigger those five senses? Do I do it online or do it offline? Do I do it online plus offline? Like, you know, what Amazon is trying to do with their Go series. I don't know, everybody might have seen that, right? So they're probably realizing that, you know, yeah, I need to, they might not be saying that we are not successful here or we've reached our end of a tether line here with retail online, so let's go back to brick and mortar. They probably might be seeing that, you know, the synergies between the two is probably what is more relevant. So um, having said that, I think experiential, some brands mentioned uh, Chumbak, I love that brand, you know, Hector Beverages Paperboard, they're not selling drinks, they're selling drinks and memories, right? So, uh, you, and you mentioned, you mentioned contextual, local and tailored experiences, the made to measure and all that the whites, et cetera, uh, you know, excellent points. But uh, from a lighting perspective, as a lighting designer myself by profession, uh, it depends on how you want to trigger those senses. A Levi store, for example, could do with less light or, you know, for lighting, less is also more in case of some brands like Levi's, right? So you'll see the stores being dark in some spaces. The ceiling is dark, painted black. You know, very few stores think of painting their stores Black, yeah, probably you do. Yeah, yeah so um, it, it depends on how you want to trigger that visual cortex or the visual sense, right? And um, uh, there are a lot of stuff going on in uh, lighting as a technology. We are very uh, uh, fortunate to be in the cusp of that change. One is the lightification part. Everybody is gunning for the efficiencies uh, or the light power density or LPD as they call it. But there are other stuff that, you know, LEDs can bring in. A huge amount of advantages on you know, because lighting as a, as, a, as, a, as a service is the most interspaced service in a store. There's no other service which is as distributed as lighting is. So uh, the way we look at it as an opportunity for our customers is that it can become a point of in-context intelligence. It can become a source of data for everybody, right? So there's this uh, talk about uh, before you set up a store, you do a lot of analytics and decide where I need to put my store in. Right, but then how do I get the data from the store once it's set up? What kind of customers come in? What kind of schemes do I run in, right? So one is data before setting up stores and one is data after you set up stores and you're running the business in the course of your business. So what we're doing is one of the things that we're doing, I, I'm sure all of you would have heard of this, um, is this uh, lights, light fixtures becoming a point of information. Uh, light itself becoming a source of transmitting and receiving data called Li-Fi. Right, so this is a thing which has come up uh, quite recently. I mean, it's been there, so people are getting venture funding and all that for this. Um, so data transmitted over light. So Wi-Fi is basically radio waves and you know, data moves around. The light source, the mobile device, becomes a interface to communicate with the store. I mean, sir, you will realize that, you know, one of the basic tendencies people these days have is if I go into a store, I look at a product and then s Amazon Cola, Google Cola, I mean, iska price kitna hai online pe. You know, people do that. So, uh, or, I mean, uh, see, the thing is, mobile device, if you look at it the way, you know, one of my, my le business leaders told me recently, it's an extension of the personality now. It's no longer a device. It is an extension. So my mobile device is mine. So it both has my historical perspective of usage. Okay, what kind of sites do I see? What kind of, uh, okay, if I go to the airport two hours early, do I prefer to spend in the lounge, right? So then the retail space in the airport would want to get this guy in, right? Uh, we did a project with Asian Paints uh, in Mumbai uh, where they said they will not sell anything in that store. It's a experience store in Bang Bangalore, Bandra, yeah, Bandra. So what they're doing there is, uh, uh, you know, the customer walks in, he basically gets a feel of, you know, uh, how his house will look. It's very tailor-made, customized. It's, I think, a 50,000 square feet of store. They don't sell paint. They don't sell anything at all. So they just basically get the customer to, 
kind of uh, when he walks in you know the kids get some pencils they touch the pad and the whole store changes color you know it, they've got these glass nodules on top if anybody would have visited that it it is more personalization right so we're doing a project with carefer uh, in france where they are also um, they have an app already so each light fixture has these sensors which detects a person walking in has a sensor inside that light fixture and uh, it basically tells that person uh, where to go in the store yeah it's called as it is called as indoor positioning indoor positioning so you have large format retail which basically you have gps for outdoors uh, so for large offices and large stores we are talking about indoor positioning as the next big thing yeah. right so where do i go i mean i stand inside a store say a big store like you know uh, a big bazaar or any of the big stores i stand like this and i look which where where do i start from right and then the light actually light actually guides that person around to maybe through a certain logic you know where are the offers that are most attractive to this guy right or which category but which category the segment of one even i think what you were talking about you know retail space uh, <laughs> supply going to back end or what you spoke about yeah. what you speaking about mm -hmm. is how do i work at the individual uh, segmentation of a customer at an individual level versus at a mass level yes and i think that is what is happening Absolutely. with this technology or Absolutely. just an enabler yeah uh, is 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 how do we move on that and i think some of the issues sorry what, what you mentioned mm -hmm. was even stuff like you know uh, washrooms and in our category like women one of the factors we judge a showroom internally is how clean is the bathroom because if a woman has been shopping out the whole day mm -hmm. the, and it's a women category and you don't have a clean room inside and you know we can discuss fsi and cost of fsi and rent and all of that but for the category it's absolutely critical i agree completely yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. so, so uh, yeah. we have uh, you know manohar who's recently joined us welcome uh, you know we don't have much time so i will ask him to you know share his uh, thoughts on how you're able to at soch uh, differentiate on the experiences that you provide yeah and then after that we'll just summarize and wrap up I think uh, what has helped us a lot in differentiating our stores is our uh, LED uh, visuals, LED sign. Uh, what we have displays, LED displays in all the stores. And uh, this is uh, identical to our hoardings, identical to the newspaper ads, uh, the website. In fact, most of the websites have pretty boring photographs, white background, stiff. Our website has these beautiful photographs, so it's a huge differentiator. And what we are doing now is, uh, whatever styles are available in that particular store, those styles are displayed on the LED display. That's an important point. A lot of people have visuals yeah. of products which are Relevance. not available at the store. Yeah. Yeah. Right? <laughs> correct, correct. Unfortunately, so, that's one. <laughs> so I think it's a simple but powerful point. Yeah. Right? So we, we have a ARS which automatically refills, but obviously if my store in Lucknow, it'll take me three days to refill that uh, particular piece. So there's no point of putting that 60 times playing on the LED unless I have that piece. So automatically it changes, and it just shows what is available in that store. So it's linked to the inventory that's available. Sir. Correct, correct. And yeah. it's customized across all your locations. Yeah. Uh, each, nice. each location will show different photographs. And I think it's a huge draw, particularly these LED signages which we have at the entrance of the store. We have a store on 100 feet road, uh, uh, Indranagar, which has, I think, a 12 by 8. Uh, you've seen, you've seen it. It's, it's a huge, huge attraction. I mean, I want to add to this. I think uh, one must compliment uh, Mr. Manu Chatlani and the Soch team. They do a fantastic job. When I was talking about the experiential part, you were not there that time. I said a lot of the local retailers are actually able to bring in that difference. And uh, one of the brands really successfully carrying this out is Soch. Digital, digital, everybody talks about, but they are the only brand, I'll tell you, which has digital in all the stores. Right. They have a digital display in all the stores, which is fantastic. Super. And, uh, we find a lot of customers who see our uh, website and come to the store and ask for that particular piece. Like we said, the touch and feed is important. So they see the image, they like the image, Hmm? And uh, I think uh, she mentioned about uh, the art and the science part of it. So as you grow, when you have one store, the art is very, very crucial. It's probably 85% of uh, your uh, what will make you successful. But as you grow, the science becomes more and more important. 
So digital is part of it. Of course, big data at analytics and uh, science is very, very crucial. What is selling in Lucknow, what is selling in Kanpur, what is selling in Delhi is very different from what is selling in Bangalore. Even in Bangalore, our BEL road store will sell smaller sizes because of the student population. Uh, Kurti sell more there. Your forum will sell more of a higher price points. So all these analytics are become, I think once you reach a certain stage, a certain size, maybe the science is 60% as important, 40% is the art. Thank you. Just to add to your, uh, yeah. you know, what Basu was saying, uh, is what is digital and what is not digital? So for us, uh, the digital display, although it's called digital, is not digital for us. For us, digital is more in terms of the balance that we were talking about, uh, which is, uh, you know, the back-end data, the analytics, the, the seamless omni-channel. Nine steps to delivering a great total customer experience. One is I think it's important to create a compelling brand personality uh, because the brand has to come alive. Brand has to be distinctive. The brand has to be differentiated and relevant to the customer. Second, we must deliver a seam. The second point is uh, retail is all encompassing, right? Uh, we must deliver a seamless experience across channels at touch points. We should drop this word e-tail and e-commerce and stuff like that. It's retail. Retail is about customers and delivering value to them. It is effective of which channel you use and how you do it. Third is, we must care about customers and their outcomes. Fourth is, we must measure what matters to them. We spoke a lot about data. It's really important. If you don't measure it, you can't do anything about it. Finally, you know, we must hone operational excellence. We must be able to deliver on whatever we design. We need to place customers at the core, develop a customer-centric organization, be technologically aware and responsive, and finally, we must design to morph. Nothing is fixed. Everything is dynamic. Everything is about being relevant to our customers at the point that they need us and how they need us. Thank you all very much.